Have you ever wondered where the name Funny Car came from? Well, it was cars like this 1965 Chevelle altered wheelbase drag car that truly earned the name because they were just plain goofy looking, but they marked a very specific time in the history of drag racing. We're gonna go into big time detail on this particular car called the Tiger II, and we're gonna talk about the early days of AFX, match racing, and the early days of funny car racing. So stay tuned, follow along with us. We're gonna take a really in-depth look at this particular car and give you an idea of how this thing survived all these years and made it back to pristine condition like it sits right now. So if you've seen some of my other videos about old drag cars, you know that most of the time they're junky, they're ratty, they're just barely hanging together just enough to be able to piece together some history on them. Well, that's not the case with this car. Although it was ratty and barely hanging together quite a few years ago. That's when Dave Giles found this car and piece by piece by piece put it back together to what you see now. Uh, it's a pretty spectacular build. It's pretty in depth. This is not gonna be a short video. This is gonna be down and dirty in the weeds talking about every little detail on this car and a really great story of how Dave got his hands on it. So follow along with us. We're gonna learn a lot about AFX. We're gonna learn about match racing. We're gonna learn about the early days of Funny Car. So this is gonna be a really cool piece. I'm pretty excited about it and I hope you will be too. Andy Adcock and his son Jim, they were racers from Amarillo, Texas and they had previously raced a Z11 Impala back when that was a factory program, you know, they raced that in Superstock. Even though Chevrolet pulled out of the drag racing program, they were still able to get their hands on a body in white, which was this 1965 Chevelle 300. This is a base model, two-door post, would have typically had a six-cylinder and a three-speed on the tree, you know, just your base model car. But this one actually didn't have any engine. It was delivered with no VIN, no drivetrain. This was just the makings of a race car. So this thing was actually delivered to plain Chevrolet in Amarillo, and it was essentially a blank canvas. And what you'll find with a car like this is that they change dramatically at a very fast pace. So 1965 was a pivotal year for AFX and for what we now know as funny car racing. Because at this time, simultaneously, there was the Saxon Sun, Mercury Comet that was out there on nitromethane smoking the tires just about the whole quarter mile length. And then at the same time, there was the Ram Chargers altered wheelbase Mopars. Those two cars were not meant to race each other. They were in totally different classes. But as time went on, and we're talking about just months here, those cars would grow closer and closer and closer to being the same thing. The altered wheelbase cars quickly became nitro burning cars and the nitro burning cars quickly became altered wheelbase cars. And as we watch this evolve, 1965 alone was a very fast paced year as far as changes on these AFX cars and what would be called match bash cars, which were just kind of put together. They didn't fit any rules to any class. They were just match race cars. So those cars kept changing quickly, altered wheelbase, all sorts of different engine and transmission combinations. Well then in 1966, everything changed. You had tubular chassis, you had one piece fiberglass body that flipped up. It totally changed the world. But these altered wheelbase cars continued to go out there and race. Cars like this Chevelle were almost instantly outdated, but they stayed relevant by changing power plants and then eventually changing the chassis and the suspension to where these cars would hold up against the Logie chassis cars and the one-piece fiberglass bodies and all that kind of stuff. These really hacked up steel body cars were the beginning of the funny car days. So the first known picture of this car is from June of 1965 at Amarillo Dragway. And you can see here that they haven't altered the wheelbase. It's still running the stock frame. It's still a largely stock vehicle. So when they first built this car, they wanted to save weight any way that they could, so they put a fiberglass front end on it. But it was so early in the 65 year that they didn't have a 65 fiberglass front end. 
So they actually went backwards, put a 64 fiberglass front end from Fibercraft in California. You might notice that the stance is higher than normal and that's because they replaced the original coil springs in the back with leaf springs and also put leaf springs in the front with the straight axle. So this car sat, you know, like a typical gasser of the 1960s. And this car, you know, it was just a nonstop progression of changes. Every time they'd go race it, they'd bring it back and make more changes to stay relevant. And, you know, it's not like there was the internet or Facebook where they could see what these guys were doing. You know, they were looking weekly at the National Dragster magazine, Drag News, and seeing what uh, the Ram Charger boys were doing, seeing what all these different cars were doing, and they made changes accordingly. It went from a standard wheelbase to an altered wheelbase. And you'll see here in this picture from Tulsa, Oklahoma, this is definitely the most famous picture of this car because it's in a huge wheel stand, which became pretty normal for this car. The way the weight balance was on this thing, it would do wheel stands very easily. And he actually went and did exhibition runs against other wheel standers like the LA Dart. When he would come to town, they would do side-by-side -side wheel stands. So that was really cool that not only was it a competitive car as far as side-by-side -side racing, that it was also kind of an exhibition type car. Now in the early days of this car's history, it had a 376 cubic inch small block Chevy, Enderly injected, it had roller cam, it had the best of everything for 1965. And things changed quickly. By 1966, it had a 427 big block Chevrolet engine in it with Hilburn injection and nitromethane in the tank. Now this combination came from Dick Harrell who had actually driven this car on a few occasions and had blown up the 327 based small block. So he provided the 427 which made big power on nitromethane and that really just sent the thing into even more evolution because at that point the original chassis, the leaf spring suspension, all those things just were no longer relevant. So a brand new chassis was built by T-Bar. Now they had built some dragster chassis and things like that, but this was the very first T-Bar funny car chassis. It's a center steer. This was revolutionary for 1965 and 1966. You know, the Logie cars were starting to come out. Don Hardy had started building some of those long nose Camaros. You know, there were all sorts of different options for early funny cars and AFX cars and things like that. But this T-Bar kind of set the tone for what the other guys would end up doing. So center steer, very lightweight design, no frills. I mean, there it was very much a basic design with main frame rails, a very basic cage, and not much else. It was a very lightweight car. So at this point, it ran shortly as the Tiger II in this configuration, but then it completely got a makeover as far as the paint. It got a blue paint job and was renamed Blitzer. So at this point, the car was running in BXS. So you'll see that a lot of things are changing quick. One of the most notable pieces on this picture, it's got magnesium spindle mount Americans on it. Now these are very early funny car wheels. These are American torque thrusts that are patterned after the wheel that would bolt onto your car like a regular five lug but it's a spindle mount. So it's a very peculiar, very short, limited production wheel that was very specific for this era, like 65, six, around there. These early magnesium five spokes are a very crucial part of this car's history and an extremely crucial part of how Dave Giles, the guy who restored this thing, found this car. And when you see it in this configuration, they had actually removed the B pillar, the post, they removed that completely where it was just open air. So, you know, there just wasn't a whole lot of structure left in this thing. It was a cut up race car. And, you know, it really makes you wonder how this thing survived all these years uh, because there just wasn't much left of it. But what gets really interesting is after the Adcocks got rid of it, that's where this history kind of gets a little fuzzy, where we have to piece together some of these theories. And luckily we've got one picture that helps solidify this car's history after the Adcocks got rid of it. So late in this car's lifespan with the Adcocks, it actually ran for a very short amount of time with a blown and nitro injected big block Chevy. Now that engine combination didn't last very long. He actually sold it to Dave McClelland, 
the famous announcer, he was a drag racer back in the 60s and he actually put it in a drag boat and set some world records with it. So that was really cool and may he rest in peace. He recently passed away, one of the icons of drag racing history. Uh, he will be greatly missed. But he was a part of this car's history as well by buying that blown and injected combo from the Adcocks back in about 1967. Around 1968, it was sold and it left Texas and went to Alabama. And that's where J.C. Sizemore actually bought this car as a companion to his Goldenrod 55 Chevrolet, which was also an altered wheelbase car that was running up against funny cars at the time. These cars were going to small tracks like Jake's Drag Strip, Baileyton Drag Strip, places like that. And they'd get paid a few hundred bucks, they'd go do their race, and everybody was happy. The fans were happy, the racers were happy, the track was happy. So, you know, these cars continued to serve a good purpose into the late 1960s. And the last functional configuration that we know of with this car was actually by Jerry Rhodes. And you can see it in this picture right here. It says, Funny Money. And this car, altered wheelbase, you can see that they've hacked out the fender wells on the back, but you can see that this is the car. This is the Tiger II, which turned into Blitzer, which turned into, you know, the Goldenrod companion car. Now is Funny Money. And you can see here, I mean, this is a gutted out race car. There's not a whole lot left of it, but it's still on the track and it's still got those magnesium front runners. Again, a very important part of the documentation and the history of this car. So let's talk about those magnesium wheels and how it ties in with the history of this thing. So Dave Giles, he's from Tennessee. Um, he loves old drag cars. He's got a 55 Chevy drag car. He's got all sorts of cool stuff and loves drag racing history. Well, a buddy of his at work brought him a clipping from like an auto trader or some type of trader magazine, and it was a listing for old racing wheels, and it was down in Alabama. So Dave picked up the phone, called the guy. The guy still had the stuff. He knew exactly what he had, but he was really fair on the prices, and so Dave loaded up and went down there and bought several pairs and sets of wheels. Now there was some really cool stuff, 16 inch Halibrands, there were some really neat 60s magnesium wheels and a few aluminum wheels as well. So as he's moving some things around in this guy's collection, he sees two front runner spindle mount magnesium Americans, the early style, like the early funny cars ran. And he asked the guy, he picked him up and said, where's the rest of the funny car? And the guy said, oh, well, it's just down the road a piece. And he never would have imagined that the car that these things belonged to still existed, but it did. The guy took him to where the car was sitting, and it was just kind of sitting in the guy's backyard. Unbelievable that this car still existed. And it was legitimately, like, not a made-up story, not a guy pulling his leg, not anything like that. This car and these wheels are the real deal. And so Dave made his mind up, he had to own this car. And after two unsuccessful trips of trying to buy it, he was finally able to make a deal and drag this thing back home. And he said it was rough and just basically flapping in the breeze as he hauled this thing home. And he got it home, evaluated everything and just couldn't bring himself to start building it. It was too big of a project. So ultimately he sold it, kicked himself from day one of getting rid of it. And as luck and fate would have it, he ended up having the opportunity to buy the car back. So he bought it back and went full on and built this thing in incredible fashion. And you'll see it here. The details are immaculate. The paintwork is incredible. All of the, the metal flake is beautiful. The lettering, there's so many details on this car that are right on the money. And the icing on the cake are those perfectly restored magnesium spin them out front wheels. So when it came to building this car, Dave had a lot of different routes he could go. He could totally build his own car, just whatever he wanted to out of it, or he could restore it as the Tiger II, the Blitzer, or Funny Money. He had several different options there. 
So, you know, the funny money option would have been the easiest because it already had the hacked out wheel wells. You know, you could have blasted a coat of paint on it and it would have been pretty much done. But that's not the most iconic period of this car's history. And as he continued to learn that, continued to find more details, find more old pictures and advertisements and things that had this car, you know, he learned more about it and learned how significant it was. So he wanted to do this car justice by restoring it back to the Tiger II. Well, that's a tough call because this car with the T-bar chassis was most known as the Blitzer, especially you know after they removed the B-pillar and removed all the glass. It was mostly the Blitzer in that configuration, but it did run for a short period of time as Tiger II with the T-bar chassis. So that was the period, even if it was just a one month period, that Dave chose to restore this car to. So, you know, you'll see in the old pictures, the, when this car had the gold paint job and the Tiger II lettering and the 376 on the door and the plain Chevrolet and all that kind of stuff, you'll see that the car sat up real high. You'll even see that the wheelbase isn't exactly the same as it is now. It's definitely been moved around. And when you look underneath this car, even on the T-bar chassis setup, which was 1966 and beyond, you can see that it had multiple suspension mounts for different wheelbases, even then in 1966 and 67. So he decided to leave the coil spring pockets and decided to leave some of the other mounts that were already in place. He didn't cut them off and smooth them out or anything like that. He left them there and decided to go ahead and put coilovers on the back of this car because he does plan to run it and race it. Whenever he gets this thing ironed out, he does want to go make some passes with it. So, you know, he wanted a pretty sturdy rear suspension because the original coil springs were still under it, but they had collapsed and the car was sitting all crooked and, you know, it really wouldn't have been the best situation as far as performance goes to put those coil springs back in. So that's about the only modern upgrade on this whole car are those coilovers on the back. Um, he did keep a lot of the original cross members, a lot of the original mounts, and you'll see them here underneath the back of it. And this is the original rear end housing that was under the car, that's been under the car since the mid 60s. So pretty amazing that that piece held in there for all this time. Same could be said for the front axle and front suspension, all that stuff is original to the car, uh, dating back to when it had the T-bar chassis installed. So we're talking 1966. Um, so all those pieces survived, he restored them to perfection, tons of great powder coating work to preserve these pieces. Um, but he had to do a lot of work to get this thing back up to this condition. A lot of metal work, a lot of tin work on the inside uh, which he got some help from his daughter and she is an ace with aluminum work and tin work like this and you can see right here this is top-notch work some of the pieces like these pieces in the dash those are original to the car he just cleaned them up and you know they are the real deal those are original pieces that they had riveted in place back in the 60s they've made some changes to the chassis as far as like how the seat mounts and things like that but structurally, the chassis is still the same as it was back in the 60s. The way the body mounts on it is still the same as it was back then. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot to it as far as the body is concerned. The fiberglass doors are original to the car, the fiberglass front end. Um, you know, there's a lot of pieces here that are 100% original to the 1965-66 era. And Dave spent countless hours, he and his wife, spent countless hours stripping paint and completely rebuilding these fiberglass parts because they had sat outside in the weather and they were naturally thin to begin with because they're race parts. So, you know, he had to really put a lot of work into getting these things straightened up, getting them to fit on the car the way that they needed to. And you can see as he's put this thing back together, he didn't put headlights in it because this car as far as we're concerned, has never had headlights in it. Ever since the fiberglass front end was installed, it had no headlights, but it did have a piece of a grill in it. So even though this thing was super rough, they spent a tremendous amount of time straightening up the body panels, and then Trick Paint and Customs laid down a slick 
gold metal flake paint job, and this lettering is identical to the original. I mean, it's beautiful hand lettering that is just really the nice finishing touch on this car. Now, you'll notice that in the early pictures, it had a logo on the door that had 376, and it actually said uh, Enderly Injected. But in this hybrid combination where the car has the T-bar chassis, but not yet the Blitzer, it didn't actually have the 376 on the door because the car now had a 427 based big block engine. So as we go through the scrapbook on this iconic car, we'll see that this thing was used in a lot of different advertisements, including this really awesome flyer for Albuquerque Dragway, where he's doing a match race up against another ultra wheelbase car. And then we flip through here and we see National Dragster, you know, we see Drag News, we see that this thing was used in all sorts of different ads and marketing materials for different companies. Here's a great shot of the car that shows that it actually had a front bumper on it during this configuration. Sometimes the bumper was on it, sometimes the bumper was off of it. In this shot, you can see the flat hood with the fuel injection just barely sticking up. You can clearly see the 376 lettered on the door, the Tiger II lettering on the front fenders, the Krager wheels, the kind of tall stance, and you know this is just an iconic picture. As you can see, the Tommy McNeely car in the far lane, that's actually Hubert Platt's old car, another altered wheelbase car that's got big time history in the Southeast. In this shot from Amarillo Dragway, you can see that the car still using its factory frame. At this point, it's got all the fiberglass parts on it, but it's still got all the original glass. You know, they hadn't gone to that next level just yet. And it's still running the small block, still got the pretty tall stance, you know, the big springs in the front and the straight axle. It's got black steel wheels, leaf springs on the back. You know, this car was making progress. This is just kind of the middle point before they got really serious with the completely aftermarket chassis. And here's a pretty crucial piece of this thing's history in this advertisement right here, which is listed by Andy Adcock. It says, Match Racer, new 1966 Chevy Chevelle, ready to really haul for the 1966 season. This is not a 66 Chevelle, this is actually a 65 with a 64 front end. But as we read further, it says, complete new trick chassis with gold metal flake paint trimmed in black there's that short window of time where this thing had the T-bar chassis and also had the gold paint job. This is before it turned into the Blitzer. So really nice documentation right here that this car did run as the Tiger II with the gold metal flake paint job with the T-bar chassis. Now here's a really cool piece of this car's history and Dave has it packed away in this scrapbook. Now there's some little flakes of that original gold metal flake paint job. Now, this car had been painted a few times by the time that Dave got his hands on it, but some of this gold still existed like in the door jams and different areas like that. And he was able to scrape those pieces off and then closely match the paint to what is on there now. So, you know, what's on there is as close as you can get to what was on there in 1965 and 1966. Also in the scrapbook, he's got a picture of the Tiger One race car, a circle track car, that the Adcocks ran back in the 60s. A beautifully built car. You can see a bunch of chrome work. It's got a killer gold metal flake paint job on it, just like the drag car did. A really nice piece. Tires are another important part of this restoration. He's running some Goodyear power streaks on the front, which are original to the 60s. These are old school tires. It's not something you'd want to go 200 miles an hour on, but they are absolutely perfect for this restoration. So I was thrilled to be a part of this build by selling Dave an authentic pair of M&H Racemaster Slicks. Now these are 82015s, and it would have been run in the mid to late 60s. This is when wrinkle wall slicks became a thing, and these things were absolutely in great shape considering how old they are. I bought them from Doug Meyer, who drove all the way from Concord, North Carolina to our swap meet here in Dayton, Tennessee back in the fall. I bought them just because they're cool. I thought maybe we could stick them on one of our dragsters or a gasser or something, but this was the proper home for those tires. So he ended up buying them from me, cleaned them up, put them on his steel wheels, and these things absolutely look great on this car. They're the perfect size, they fit in the wheel wells just right, and they're 100% period correct for this car. So really neat that we were able to put that together 
and you know put the kind of the finishing touches on this car uh, even though there's still parts that need to be put together as far as the engine is concerned there's still a lot of missing pieces there uh, just because he's waiting on parts just like all of us you know we order parts and we have to sit and wait we're kind of at the mercy of those manufacturers but you know he did everything that he could with the original parts on this car he saved everything that he could he salvaged it he made something out of a car that most people would have just sent down the road this would not have been a meaningful car to very many people but he knew the history actually he didn't when he bought it he didn't know the history but as he learned more about it he became more appreciative of the history of it and it drove him to keep pushing forward and keep making this thing more and more correct so this is just an excellent example of a beautifully restored car that accurately represents what these things were in the mid to late 1960s and it's one of the finest drag car restorations that i've ever seen and it's not even complete yet he's still got some details to add to it so i'm excited to see this thing as it continues to be buttoned up and i'm extremely excited and i'll bring it to you here as soon as I hear this thing run. We're gonna take some video of that. I hope to be able to hear that. I'd love to see this thing move under its own power. This thing is just a beautiful piece of drag racing history and I wanted to bring it here to you guys and just go into the details here. Even though this is a little bit longer video than I normally do, it's a little bit more raw than what I normally do, it really does show you the details and the history and the significance of this car. So I hope you enjoyed watching this and I hope that you will continue to watch my content, whether it's about old drag cars or big car collections or vintage junkyards or some of this junk that we work on in the shop. So thank you for watching and we'll see you next week.